My name's Anna Hughes and I am really, really pleased to be hosting uh, this, uh, this talk. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming Jack Thurston. He's going to be talking about his books, about cycling, about uh, low carbon travel, about all these kinds of exciting things. Well, we're going to be talking about that, I should say. Um, and I just want to uh, start with uh, showing one of Jack's four books, uh, Lost Lanes West. So this is the one I have. Jack very kindly signed it for me. And uh, we, um, one of the things about these books, I think they're just beautiful, really fantastic photography throughout, wonderful maps. I'm a real map geek. This is the kind of thing that really pleases me. And they're just so, so they're really, really lovely, uh, really, really well laid out and very well written, really beautifully written. And it's the kind of book that honestly makes you want to go there. There are so many rides in each one. Um, and I've done a couple of the ones here in Lost Lanes West, but it's just, uh, it should come with a wanderlust warning. <laughs> warning, this will make you want to get on your bike. Um, so welcome, Jack. Um, do you want to start by telling us about how you got into all this, how you became a cyclist perhaps? Yeah, that, thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Anna. Really kind of you. And thank you for hosting this session. And obviously thanks to the, Laura and the, the, her team at the Cycle Touring Festival for carrying on in a second year of virtual stuff. Um, but there's been some brilliant stuff. So I know we sh should all be camping in a field outside Clitheroe right now. Well, maybe not in February, in May, um, but we're not and we're making the best of it. And so that's brilliant. And obviously, if anyone has a few pennies that they can chip towards the festival to keep it going for next year, that, that would be really appreciated, I think. Um, but yeah, so how did I get into cycling and how did I get into writing books about cycling? I guess they're two separate questions. I didn't come from an especially, you know, bikey family, uh, but there were bikes around growing up. I think anyone growing up in the 70s and early 80s, there were bikes around and, you know, you enjoyed riding them. Um, I have memories of riding across um, Midsummer Common in Cambridge on my tiny little bike with my mum on a, her enormous rally beside me and that felt like a very powerful childhood impression and then throughout my childhood really um, the bicycle has just been a kind of vehicle of freedom um, sort of camping trips with my friends at school when we were teenagers just to get away from the weekend it was always a good excuse you know you wouldn't get away with just uh, you know saying oh can I just disappear for two days you know to do X, Y, and Z, but if it was, you know, going to camp in the Chilterns, that seemed kind of wholesome. And the fact that we were getting up to all the same stuff that we'd have been getting up to, you know, down the back of the garages or wherever else we might've gone, you know, the parents didn't seem to mind so much. Um, and then when I was in the sixth form, we started a cycling club, or it's more of a cycle touring club as a way really of getting off games like traditional games stomping around a muddy field so um for that yeah for the, during the sixth form just on a Wednesday afternoon about I don't know a dozen or 20 of us with one teacher would get packed lunches and so cycle down to the railway station um at, at where was that Ali Pali somewhere and hop, hop on the train out into Hertfordshire and do about 20 25 miles and then hop on the train and come back and sometimes stop at the pub before we did that. Um, and actually, one of the people who was the instigator of that, um, Daniel Starr, is the publisher of, of Lost Lanes. Uh, that looks a bit weird, doesn't it? They're coming into and out of uh, my background. <laughs> yeah, your background's really um, scuffed that one, Jack. <laughs> it has, isn't it? Um, so Daniel Starr um, wrote some books about swimming in the outdoors in the sort of 2000s I suppose and off the back of the success of those they were called Wild Swimming the books Wild Swimming and Wild Swimming Coast and off the back of those he decided that um, there was more money in books if you were the publisher than if you were being published so he decided to set up a publishing company basically to publish his own books um, but in order to get any credibility with distributors to get the books actually into bookshops he couldn't appear to be just publishing his own books so he said to most of his mates, like, can you just come up with a concept for a book and we'll like make a cover for it and put it in the catalogue. And you don't actually have to write it. 
as long as it's there in the catalogue so that we show that we show to the distributors, then we'll get My Wild Swimming books in all the Waterstones and all the whatever around the country. So, so he said, Jack, you must have a cycling book because at that point I was writing a bit about cycling in my spare time and presenting a podcast about cycling called The Bike Show. Um, and so I thought, oh, this would be fun. Uh, you know, and, we, and sort of dreamt up basically what was a book that actually ended up happening, which was the first Lost Lanes. And it was really just all my favorite places to cycle within easy reach of London. And I'd sort of, in my twenties, I'd read um, the Nick Cotton series of books and used those. I don't know if anyone remembers those. They're kind of done with the Ordnance Survey and they were quite cool. They were, the rides were great. And I used to use those to kind of go, you know, out cycling in Kent and Sussex and Essex and places like that. And I, but I quickly found that I was the kind of the cycling one and the more like, I'll just go for a bike ride, whatever. But my friends needed a bit of persuasion about why they should spend their Saturday, you know, getting up a bit earlier, getting on a train, you know, cycling. And so I had to kind of dream up reasons why we should go for a bike ride. Like the bluebells are gonna look amazing at this time of year, or we can go to this oyster shack on the beach, or we can take this foot ferry, or we can see four different kinds of windmill or, you know, whatever it might be, some sort of pretext that, the, that we will do this by bike, because that's obviously the way to, you know, <laughs> way, way we're gonna do it. But that was the main object. It wasn't like we're gonna do 40 miles or we're gonna do 50 miles. And then we just go out and basically have a really nice day, um, you know, in the countryside. And that's really what the first Lost Lanes was all about, was about those sorts of routes, um, day rides accessible by train from central London stations. And it, it kind of, I think it just was quite lucky timing that a lot of people had bought bikes off the back of, well, London's transport crisis and the fact that people realised that it was quicker and easier to get to work by bicycle. I think the seven, seven bombings, which I don't know what year that was, I can't remember, might have had some impact on that. And then obviously there were the sort of the sporty stuff with Wiggins and Team GB. And there were a lot of bike sales. And then so all these people commuting to work in London and but not really using their bikes at the weekends. And so I thought, well, look, if I can put them, a, give them a few ideas and make it look really, really enticing and really attractive. And this is where I thought I would improve on Nick Cotton's books by having a really nice photography um, that I did myself um, because we didn't have budget for a photographer um, and um, sort of a bit deeper history and um, culture and geography, a little bit more information and more context, I suppose, and more seduction than you'd get in a traditional cycling guidebook, which tend to be a little bit functional, I would say. There could be some really good ones and some really great routes, but they do appear a little bit functional. You have to know that you want to go for a bike ride to get the most, or to even want to pick up one of those books. Whereas the idea with Lost Lanes was that people would pick up the book and go, oh yeah, I really fancy doing that because it yeah. would just sell it to them. So that was the idea. And, and also partner the bike ride with all kinds of things like eating, drinking, swimming, yeah. um, camping, um, doing I stuff with kids you know, all that kind of stuff. I think the books do that so fantastically because it is about the me meandering. It is about the kind of it, uh, making it an experience rather than just a bike ride. And, and like, I, like I said about the beautiful photography and, and just the really vivid descriptions and those kinds of things, it's, um, it's, not a, it's not a guidebook in the sense of picking it up and it just giving you information about where you're going. It's, more, it's very much more inspirational than that. And I think that's a lovely aspect to the books. Um, and I really love the, I really love that your early early experiences were uh, this games teacher taking you out of school and going for a bike ride. I mean, what kind of cool games teacher was that? That sounds amazing. The kinds of things that we should perhaps be uh, uh, having in schools at the moment. Um, so yeah, so um, I I like that concept of um, people who have a bike because they're commuting to work or something, um, trying to encourage them to go and explore and, and use that bike as a method of exploration. Um, so was that kind of what happened with the other books as well? Or, or was it, uh, did the idea develop once you'd done the first book that wasn't just an, an idea in a catalogue that actually became a book? It must've been very well yeah, received. Yeah, I mean, there is, 
that's a good point and a good observation. There is a big, there's quite a big difference between the structure of the first one, which is all about, well, mostly about, there were some London routes, but sort of within sort of inner, inner urban routes, but basically it was about hopping on a train to the home counties, essentially, or as far away as the Isle of Wight and kind of doing a day or two ride um, like that. Whereas, you know, if you're in Bristol, living in Bristol, you're not going to get hop on a train to Penzance and go and cycle down, you know, <laughs> down to Land's End, are you? Um, I mean, you might do as part of a longer journey, but that's not really the same thing as, as, as getting on a commuter train out of from Waterloo into Kent and, and doing a spin from there. It's not the same sort of thing. So I think what I've, what, I, what the, what the, other three books so that's uh, Wales and the borders and um, West West Country and Northern England they're they're a little bit more about kind of destination guidebooks sort of so somewhere to go you know go here for a weekend stay for a weekend if I mean unless you're lucky enough to live in the Pennines which you know or to live you know in in the Quantock Hills or whatever like that most people are probably gonna from the big urban you know pop urban centers are going to be going somewhere for a weekend or a longer trip or maybe stringing together three or four of the routes into a, a longer journey and so that required a little bit of um, development to kind of make them knit together a bit and also I think in some ways I mean in Wales you know the whole of the middle of Wales once you're out of the kind of industrial south is just amazing for cycling so you almost don't need a guidebook you just kind of plonk yourself in the middle of Wales and ride and it's great um, and there are you know the Yorkshire Dales are the same you know it's just incredible cycling country wherever yeah. you go you don't need to pick your way you know on country lanes to avoid the big retail parks and the industrial estates and all the rest of it like you do have to in in yeah. southern England yeah. um, so in a way I was more trying to you know to present those the best cycling in those areas to probably an audience that you know perhaps was not from that part of um, England or Wales um, so that they would you know be tempted to to make a journey to that place to do some cycling so if that makes any sense I know it's a slightly it's a yeah. sort of fine-grained difference but um, also I think that the you know the rates of cycling out of London sadly are still quite low with the exception of a few places like mm. Cambridge and York mm -hmm. maybe you know Cardiff yeah. and Bristol um, I think London has, has got a lot of cyclists and you know my book sales you know this the southeast one the, the first one has outsold all of the others by like six to one wow so it's been a real yeah. commercial success yeah. you know that the okay. others haven't been really <laughs> Daniel Stark must be thrilled <laughs> very pleased with you <laughs> I think he's, yeah I think I think he's well you know we, we're good friends but yeah. we didn't fall out over these <laughs> books fortunately yeah that's great so and I'm um, working on um central England at the moment which oh, is an interesting brilliant. one because yeah. that's not so much you know like it's it's a it's a great challenge actually not I'm not saying central England is not nice but it's you know and there are obviously I'm including the Cotswolds within my remit and mm. and the southern part of the Peak District so um you know there's there's some amazing you know national park level you know country there but it's also quite fun to be kind of looking at places that aren't necessarily quite so famous as you know Yorkshire Dales Northumberland Coast Lake District you know which sort of people are aware of those places being places that you really should yeah, get destinations. to destinations yeah absolutely so yeah I'm kind of trying to persuade people to you know spend a spend a long weekend cycling around Leicestershire which yeah. you know is fantastic yeah if absolutely, you know yeah. the places to go you know exactly right um, one of the things I like particularly is that, as you say, everything you try to make everything accessible by train, which I think that's quite important in kind of the, the overall scheme of things. You know, um, we've spoken about this before, and I know the Cycle Touring Festival has focused on this as well. The fact that bicycle is the lowest carbon form of transport you can have. Um, and so it's it's it, I mean, we did a bikes on trains event this time last year in the in the festival last year um because they're natural partners um and it does mean that you can you know there are it, it does open up a lot of places uh, around the uk so it, was that kind of your motivation the 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 ease of access or the the low carbon nature or just the fact that staring out of the window on a train is quite fun yeah i mean i really 
I really love traveling by train and also feel slightly depressed when I see bikes on the back of cars. And, you know, especially when they're passing me like with this much space, which, you know, does happen. Um, I kind of, I don't know, I tried to come up with a good metaphor for um, taking driving with your bike in your car. And I couldn't come up with one. They were all a bit, a little bit harsh. Um, <laughs> Like having a yeah, wee we, in the swimming don't... pool was sort of, was sort of <laughs> oh, one no. I got close to. Um, <laughs> we don't I want to exclude bit... the entire car driving audience. <laughs> no, I mean, I, we have a, I have a, I have my family, have, we have a car. Of course, um, yeah. I, You know, don't use it very often. Also got an electric cargo bike for local stuff. Um, so, you know, there is, of course, there's a place, there's, there's and there have to be a place for the car. We've built for the car for the last hundred yeah. years. We're not just going to suddenly, you know, voluntarily, switch them all off um so you know and especially having got rid of half of the railways um with the beaching cuts but i mean i don't want to be become a political ranty person but um yeah i did i did want to give people the option to go by train because it's really nice um and i think it is sustainable um more sustain certainly more sustainable than than driving somewhere and you know your your holiday you know in an ideal world i know I've had horrible train experiences, particularly with a bike on like Great Western um, with that massive scrum to get in. Even if you've got a reservation, you sometimes don't make it um, on the Friday night train out of Paddington. But, mm. um, but I also have had some pretty mean guards on the Transpennine Express, I have to tell you, during the, during the last book, because I do as much of the research as I can for the books using train to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um so yeah, it can um, be a bit yeah hit, but ideally you know you, in an ideal world you, you know your holiday starts you know the moment you sit down in that railway carriage and like crack open your first you know can of carling um <laughs> it's, it's kind of that it's which is not what happens when you're in a, in a in a car you just sort of kind of got to drive up the motorway and blah 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 and then yeah. worry about you know what you're gonna do with your car at the other end and whatever yeah so yeah, so I did. I, I, it's not possible to, to get everywhere by train. So there are some rides where it's been difficult, but I've always tried to make it kind of close as close as can be. Oh, um, okay, yeah. yeah, brilliant. Well done. Um, okay, we've got loads of good questions coming through the Q and A, um, but I've got one more of my own, which is simply, what is a lost lane? Ah, uh, yes. What is a lost lane? Now I'm um, often asked this question. Um, and there is, there is a sort of romantic answer and there's a kind of practical answer. Let's have um, a romantic answer. <laughs> let's have the romantic answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll, and then followed up by the plastic, because they're, because it's good to, everyone I think knows what a lost lane is. It's like a, it's, you know, it's a surf, generally a, 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 a lane that you can cycle down on, you know, any kind of bicycle. You know, so we're not talking about green lanes for mountain bikes and and that kind of thing so it's a gravel it could be a good gravel track or an unmetalled byway or but more likely it's a a very narrow country lane that's like a farm lane um that doesn't have much traffic on it and um you know you really feel in contact with your surroundings there whatever they are whether it's going through a wood or on the on the you know on the edge of a balcony lane on the edge of a hill um, and you're just this strip of lovely tarmac that's easy to ride along, but you know you're completely cut off from you know the hurly burly. Um, you've got great views all around, um, smells, sights, you know the wind in your hair. You just feel like this. I just want this to go on forever. Those yeah. kinds of lanes, um, I think or the it could ones, be um... like a, a really atmospheric holloway where you know you've got the trees going over. It's getting a little bit dark. And you're kind of a little bit worried. Are you going to make it to the end of where you got to get to that day? And <laughs> that you hear an owl hooting, and and you know you wonder if that that really gnarled beech tree is just going to reach out and kind of grab you and pull you in, <laughs> like something out of Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. So it's those sorts of places, and they are places. That's what distinguishes them from roads, in a sense, that because they it's a place in itself. If you stop and just listen and look you will feel like you're in a world on the lane whereas if you're on a road you're kind of like going from here to there it's like a practical matter of getting from the, you know a to b and wow. so that's that's kind of I a like romantic that. definition yeah, i like that now how do you find much. these things <laughs> 
how do you find these things? Um, it's actually got a pretty simple answer um, for me anyway. Um, is you get an ordnance survey map out, the Land Ranger one to fifty thousand map, and you look for the little, the thinner of the two yellow roads, which are the unclassified roads, um, but the thinnest ones, and they they are thinner than the slightly fatter ones because they are um, less than four meters wide, and the reason why being less than four meters meters wide is the key, is because it's very difficult for two cars to pass one another. On these lanes without one having to back having to stop to really slow down back up push themselves into the hedgerow or whatever and so drivers really don't like using them unless they absolutely have to use them and they when they do drive along them generally and i know this isn't always the case but generally you know they are aware of the fact that if anything is coming towards them you know any vehicle um they're going to have to stop and so they're not you know going along at 60 miles an hour so that is the sort of that is the archetypal lost lane and that's what i try and stitch together as much of those as i can within a route of you know whatever day's ride 40 to 60 miles i suppose um so yeah i i don't know that you can really find them using google maps or you know Kamut or any of the even open street map i don't think it distinguishes them sufficiently well um, that's a good tip actually I, I, I love cycle.travel which is their Hurst one so if you're not if you don't you know but but these days ordnance survey maps are so cheap you know if you don't get the paper ones and the paper ones are great but I also you know you can get them on your phone or your tablet or whatever and it's like 20 pounds or 25 pounds a year for all of the ordnance survey maps which is just an amazing deal I'm not hawking ordnance survey stuff here but um, you know that, that that is definitely the best resource I think for a really discerning, intimate exploration and discovery of a, re a, a fairly small region of the countryside. Yeah. You know, if you really want to get you know get to grips with it, understand the topography, understand something of the history and the cover, and get a sense of what it's like to cycle in before you go and then when you're there to interpret what you're seeing around you they are they are unbeatable yep very very much agree there jack um and uh yeah a couple of my favorite ones from this the lost lanes west book which, so i used to live in uh, bath uh, which is on one of your routes and so a lot of these ones were very accessible from from where i lived um and a couple of the ones that really capture my imagination are the old military roads um, so one on the Isle of Purbeck and then through Salisbury Plain as well. Those are the ones that I... Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's yeah, nothing like cycling through a, those firing ranges and stuff like that. There's, yeah. There's, and, and, there's, and the great thing about um, the bicycle is you've just got so many options. You can go on, particularly in that, that part of the world where you used to live, you know, you've got the canal towpath, you've got mm. those mm -hmm. ranges, uh, the, the, road, the gravel tracks up on Salisbury Plain. Um, you've got some, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the old well railway cycleway bus trans and railway paths and things yeah. like that you, i think the bicycle is just the most flexible vehicle for you know pretty much you know yeah all sorts of yeah and, and even yeah. if you even if you have to put your you know put it over your back and get over a stile and walk through a field <laughs> or whatever you know you can still do that with a bicycle uh, which you can't i mean it's preaching to the converted here at the cycle touring festival but <laughs> it really is the truth isn't yeah. it yeah Okay, so the first question from our Q&A. So just a reminder to everybody, uh, the chat's live and that's just uh, re remember to select all panellists and attendees when you um, are submitting things to the chat. But if you want to ask an actual question to Jack, that is through the Q&A function. So our first question is going to be about the podcast and about Resonance FM as well. So we've had a couple of questions saying, um, are there any more podcasts on the way or uh, the Resonance FM bike show is is that kind of now replaced by podcasts? So what can you say about your broadcasting? Uh, please? Yeah, well, it's a bit of a sorry story. Um, I think I really missed the podcasting takeoff because I started, started doing the radio show in 2004 and then started, a listener got in touch and said, can you make it into a podcast? And I said, what's a podcast? And so in 2005, in spring 2005, started putting it as a podcast. 2005, who was pod? Casting in 2005 it was like me and about 20 other people um and then obviously you know the moment I sort of you know children arrive and I moved to Wales and kind of my life just sort of 
becomes suddenly a lot more complicated and I'm not doing the work, the money work that I was doing when I was living in London. Um, time became an issue in a way that it wasn't before. Anyone you know who's um, started a family would know about that. Um, anyone who's given up all their work and tried to basically survive doing odds and ends of cycle journalism and writing books would know about that. So the podcast was a bit of a casualty. I really enjoy doing it. Um, but there's a lot of competition out there now. I think people have got a lot more great stuff to listen to. So if I were to sort of do it again in any serious way, it would have to meet a kind of higher standard, I think, because of what people are used to um, listening to. Um, and also I'd have to try and figure out a way, some way of making it, you know, if not pay money, then at least cover some costs um, because, yeah, it was all pretty much done. I did over 250 episodes and they're all, they're all there still on the, on the, uh, on the archive. So they're all available. Um, and so you must have done two, 250 to 300 episodes. And, you know, it just cost me money to do them, really. Everything, travel. I didn't get a single bit of sponsorship. And it's quite hard, to, you know, when you sell a book, you know, you get a couple of quid. Um, mm. When you, set, someone downloads your podcast, you know, unless you're really great at advertising and you've got a really massive <laughs> one, you don't really get anything. Yeah. So that's the we've, answer. Sorry. We've had bit, a comment, by the way. Um, Terry Wogan was podcasting in 2005. <laughs> There you go, Jack. You were up there with Terry Wogan. Oh, yeah. Well, what happened to him? <laughs> oh. Is that an actual it was question? The podcast, <laughs> did it? Um, okay, so uh, the next question from our Q&A list is about Scotland. So do you have any plans for a Lost Lanes Scotland? Yes. Um, every time I meet my publisher, Dan, he says, you've got to do Scotland next. You've got to do Scotland next. Um, and I would love to do Scotland next, but I think it's a massive, great country. Um, I'm not even sure one book would be enough. Um, and I'd have to spend quite a lot of time up there, which basically with children of prime, you know, they've only just started, um, the youngest one only just started at primary school. Um, and my wife, runs a business and is far more successful doing what she does than I am doing what I do so I you know I can't really just disappear off to Scotland for six weeks at a time um, much as though I would love nothing more <laughs> than to do that um, so central England is next and I think Scotland will be after that assuming you know pandemic times are over and um, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to do it if I'm going to be like camping my way around, which is what I normally do in this tarp, as you, you can see behind. I'm going to have to do it in kind of April and May, aren't I, before the midges yeah. come out? <laughs> Very true. Yeah. So, yeah, I would love to do I would love to do Scotland. I think I'm also slightly scared of of Scotland because I've not for every for all the other um, books, I've had a fairly good base load of knowledge that, that then the two year process of research and writing kind of filled out and deepened. Whereas Scotland, I've holidayed in Scotland, but I never lived there and I have never cycled there. So I wow, would be starting that's from interesting. scratch. I'm sure our chat box is going to blow up now with all the wonderful places you should be cycling in Scotland. Oh yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way. Help, um, me, one... help me, help me do the work. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I'd comment... really love to do it. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, one comment came in from me, the previous question, which is about podcasting, um, saying that, um, well, it, uh, it just says, I'd pay a subscription for the podcast, as I'm sure you, um, as I'm sure many other words, many others would, sorry. Oh. The good thing about your podcasting style is it's easy and unpretentious. So that's a nice thing to, um, that's a nice comment to have, isn't it? And something to perhaps bear in mind. Oh, so. Very nice. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Oh, I think the thing, I mean, I think also would think the thing about the thing about the podcast is that the most successful episodes and the episodes that I've been most proud of are the ones where I've been out and about interviewing someone or or doing some sort of journey and in and meeting people. And that's much harder to do, I think, in the pandemic. So it would, you know, you'd probably end up with quite a lot of like Zoom chats, which is everyone is really saturated by Zoom chats. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, I, I would, I'm hoping to do a kind of spring season of, of the podcast, but it will probably be quite 
remote, you know, Zoom uh, chat. Yeah. Heavy, okay. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and now back to the Scotland oh, but let, 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 On the broadcasting side of things, a little yeah. scoop here for you all. Um, I have mentioned it on Twitter, sort of, it, but um, this new GCN Plus, which is um, GCN Global Cycling Network, they're quite sporty type of cycling people, but there's a new subscription channel that they're putting out, which is, I think, merging with Eurosport to have all the race, the racing stuff. But they, they, they commissioned and made with me three Lost Lanes films last year. Um, so where I ride with like a professional bike racer and try and get them to slow down for, for a weekend. So um, they are, they are, they are going to be on GCN, believe it or not. Um, oh, I love that not, idea. Not the YouTube piece again, but they're like this. They're proper like forty-minute documentaries. Unbelievable! Wow, fantastic! So, um, yeah. In fact, not being totally um, idle. No, that that ties in quite nicely to what I was going to say next. So we'll come back to the Q and A in a moment. Um, but something that you and I have both talked about before, Jack, and and we um, this is something that we both kind of believe in quite a lot is is that very thing you just mentioned about slowing down and finding the finding the unusual things about the local area in which we live or you know um, discovering the treasures in our backyard um, and that's that's very much my ethos as a cyclist I do most of my touring in the UK partly because I I don't fly I'm an I'm an environmentalist and, and I'm not um, again I, I don't um, haven't flown for about 10 years and I'm not going to start doing that um, but it's also because there is so much to uncover here um, and I think we can often overlook what's in our own backyard. Um, so yeah, UK exploration is very much a, a passion of mine. And I know that's true for you as well. Um, so perhaps is that something that uh, you're maybe, uh, one of the messages you're trying to get across as well, kind of slow down, look, see what there is here, you know, un under our noses, all those kinds of treasures. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, with, with a pandemic on, we've got no choice, really, at the moment. We are confined to our localities. And then even if there is a kind of opening up in the spring and summer, we're, you know, confined to our island. Um, but when you're on a bicycle, I think the world becomes so much bigger in, in a good way, you know, because it takes you longer to get places, but along the way you experience so much more than you do in any other mode of transport apart from walking, I suppose. Um, so I think I'm hoping that there's going to be a kind of, you know, resurgence in cycle touring in Britain at, over the over this year, and that that will convince people that it's a great way to go. There are some, you know, it's all it's all yeah, paying attention to to what's around you, how the seasons are changing, um, going you know, looking at a particular zone. And, and, and there's a very nice book called um, English Country Lanes by a writer called Gareth Lovett-Jones. Um, it was written in the 1980s. And it's kind of like, I discovered it only after finishing Lost Lanes North. And it's, but it's basically like the, the, by, the gospel of what I'm all about, but it's written by this guy in the 1980s. And I'm just completely in love with this book. Um, and he has a very specific technique, which is kind of like more than, um, what I'm doing with Lost Lanes in a way, because I present actual routes that you kind of follow around. And he he sort of is a bit dismissive of that approach. And he wanted his readers to, to just explore by themselves. And so he's kind of equipping them with the mental outlook to just take an area of land, uh, maybe bordered by like a natural boundary or a, could, or a main road, just a little section of land that might be, you know, might only be, 10 miles by 20 miles um, or even less actually and just crisscross it go back and forth go all the way around you know in, in, look at all the lanes and all the lanescapes as he, he, he calls them um, and that's a completely different way of thinking about bicycle travel than um, the, the sort of you know how many miles have I done um, today like have I done a, five, a 200 mile ride you know or have I gone from like this London to Newcastle or wherever it is that like that's the objective to, and, and I can see the there is appeal an appeal in like riding from Land's End to John O'Groats although I've never done that myself um there is I can see a, that there's a sort of sense of lost lanes, but Land's there is another way of doing it which is which is to immerse yourself into a landscape and really come away from like a couple of days or three days of having really understood 
what it's all about and had some really interesting varied experiences in that in that way that is very different from a sort of very linear approach of like start here finish there mm. um so yeah i mean as regards the future of of sort of sustainable travel i mean the bicycle is just it's it's got to be at the heart of it it's just so perfect i mean the the bicycle you can just dif people can just diffuse themselves into the countryside so you don't end up with those tourist and like virus spreading hotspots that you would where everybody like arrives at the huge national trust car park and like gets as far away as you can on foot which isn't probably very far but the, where the nearest loo is or something like that and then like it's down there on burton bradstock beach just like you know with hordes of people and a bicycle you can just disappear and within like half an hour's riding you won't see anybody um and it's wonderful the the, the the countryside can just absorb so many people doing that kind of cycling um i think there there are some problems with accommodation potentially challenges because i think a lot of um accommodation providers are going to be quite doing quite well good business this summer and, and a lot of them i noticed last year were saying kind of multiple night bookings only which is not so good if you're sort of moving around a bit um but then if you're camping, you can always wild camp, which, you know, is great. And that adds a whole new dimension of excitement yeah. and adventure to, to any journey. But also if you're if you're cycling and a, 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 a campsite might be full, like they might say, no, we're full this weekend. Um, and they, they probably mean they're full to like car campers who need a full pitch for their vehicle and their hookup and their like tent space. But if you turn up, a couple of people or four people with a few tents on bikes i bet 95 percent of campsites will be able to accommodate you um you know for the night mm -hmm. for that night so yeah the bicycle is just so light touch in every way on other people on the landscape um you know on on the environment and the ecology and the climate um it's yeah, yeah. it's really Thanks. it's it's really, really wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Really inspiring. Um, okay, next question from the list is, what is your ultimate favourite ride from the original Lost Lanes? Oh, la la. Oh, gosh. Now you see, the, the, <laughs> there's a lot of emotion tied up with that book, writing that book, because I grew up in London and um, I knew I was moving to Wales after that summer. And it was almost like a farewell tour. And I did rides mostly with friends. Um, and so we had some great times and all the people you'll see in Lost Lane's books are just my friends They're you know, and family. They're not like, I didn't hire models or anything. Well, it's pretty obvious if you look at them. But, <laughs> uh, um, so, oh gosh, I'm stalling for time, aren't I? I mean, oh, I actually think well, I'm gonna, I, one of my favourite rides is the, is the um, Eastern Excursion ride, which is an urban ride in London that goes out from um, like Broadway Market in Hackney out to, uh, along the green, um, Greenway, the old sewage pipe, out to the Beckton and then over on the Woolwich Ferry and back along the Thames and up through Mile End Park. Um, that is a great, great way to show anyone who comes to London, you know, you can do 30 miles pretty much traffic free in the city and see something interesting everywhere. Um, but as far as um, rides, other, the countryside rides, uh, gosh, it's like trying to be asked to choose your favorite child. Um, <laughs> I think I think I've 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 become like mesmerized by the chalk downland of southern England and that is a character in in the first book and also the West Country book um, so like Salisbury Plain all the chalk kind of expanses that is sort of centered around Stonehenge and like reaches out towards the Berkshire Hills and the Thames basically so I would say whichever the route is that gets you up onto that that one I think it's a route from Didcot or Reading Actually, it's that Reading route. I think it's what, yeah, one of the, the Reading routes that goes up to the Bell in, in Aldworth. And oh my God, don't we miss pubs <laughs> in this pandemic? And the Bell Inn is, in Aldworth is just the great, oh, it's a lovely pub if you've not been there. Um, and then you, yeah, there's a little bit of Ridgeway to ride 
some great descents. You've got this couple of swimming spots in the Thames. And how great is it to swim in the Thames? I mean, that's, you know, yeah. that's something. Um, and it's all like accessible from Reading. So I would say probably, probably one of those. Um, it just kind of has everything. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so a similar question, but kind of the opposite question, which is, uh, what is the ride you want to do, the tour or the micro trek? So something that you haven't done before, but that you really would love to. Oh, um, gosh, I've been, um, I've been pitching some ideas around to uh, travel editors and things like that. And actually the route, and it was this, and it was inspired a little bit by Rob, and this is a longer journey, this isn't a day's journey, but by Rob Ainsley's talk yesterday on rivers. I don't know if anyone, I'm sure there are people who are at that. That was a great talk. Sorry, I'm not gonna be able to break out the guitar at the end of this one. <laughs> um, but um, you so the, basically the idea would be starting from Chepstow, which is just down the road from me in Abergavenny, um, and I have plotted this route. If anyone wants my draft, I will share it with you happily. Um, and you basically follow the River Y upstream to the source of the River Y, which is in the Cambrian Mountains on uh, Pimlimon, um, the sort of great sort of sacred mountain of central Wales. And one mile, no, not much more than one mile from the source of the Y is the source of the Severn. So once you've got to the source of the Y, you then swap rivers and you come back on the Severn, back down essentially to Chepstow where the Y joins the Severn. So you do wow. this kind of river iron loop up the Y and back down the Severn. So I think that, that would be a ride That sounds my type of ride, definitely. <laughs> okay, um, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, one actually is just clarifying, what was that book you were talking about? The Gareth Lovett Jones one? The name? Uh, English Country Lanes. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that answers for you, Leslie, and a couple of other people wrote that on the chat as well. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'm just going to scroll through the questions here um, just to pick a couple of extras. Um, but uh, you mentioned wild camping. So um, do you mm. have any uh, particular tips or we, the other day when we were talking, we were saying any anecdotes or funny stories about wild camping or anything uh, that you want to share? <laughs> yeah um so the tips are which i will then probably explain how i completely don't follow my own advice but um i would say get get away from get a reasonable distance away from any road um just because that's where most of the population is you know they're on roads they're not like on bridleways and things like that so you know even if you see a bridleway and you know the branches off a road you can take that for like even you know 500 meters or something like that and you'll be suddenly in a new level of isolation and seclusion from um from the road um and yeah don't camp on cultivated land um you know check if there's any livestock in the field try and avoid livestock um this whole thing about like, ask the landowner you know my it's really very very difficult to do that i think there are some cases where you probably could do it um you know, knock on the door of the farm and say, can I, you know, and I have, I've thought about doing that a few times and I never actually done it because I will usually, it's just seems a bit difficult. You never quite know whose land it is. And my, my sort of feeling with the, if you, if you're close enough that, that they can see you from the farmhouse, then you're too close. Mm -hmm. So you need to get further away. Um, and it's always easier to ask for, you know, forgiveness after the event than per permission beforehand. Um, you know, leave, leave early um don't have a campfire you know absolutely don't have a campfire um you know just respect the land make it you know take any litter out that you find that's already there perhaps if there's anything obviously don't leave anything um nice bit of level ground um have yeah you had any you know, kind of... you, sometimes you can identify a, sorry Anna. have you had any sort of funny experiences or kind of eek that was close <laughs> So yeah, so the, the experience I had is so this is this is at the other end of the chalk downland from the Bell in Aldworth. So this is actually just up the road from uh, Devizes, basic. Was it Devizes? Yeah. So just up the road from there. There's a very. I arrived late because I think I'd cycled up from like Devon or something that day on like some Oof. mega distance covering thing because I couldn't get the bike on the train or something like that. So I'd just done some mega miles um 
trying to get to where I needed to be for the next day's research. Um, and so I thought I was on this ne Neolithic like stone, bar Neolithic burial mounds were sort of marked on the thing. And I thought, okay, well, I'll go near there. Um, that'll have a nice view in the morning, maybe get a nice photograph. Um, and so I, I cycle up this, this, this track to get there. And then I see all these lights at the top and I'm like, oh no, there's some like yobbos up there who are gonna like, you know, get me, make trouble for me or something like that. Or they're, or they're lamping hairs or something, some horrible, you know, <laughs> rural practice. Um, but actually it was a bunch of stargazers and they were, they were kind of like um, the people out of detectorists, you know, just really nice blokes who were just like talking about, you know, different things they were looking up in the night sky. And so I checked with them of what they thought about it and about camping over there. And they said, oh yeah, it should be okay. Um, just like, just like mined out for the livestock. And I was like, oh yeah, that's not so good. But I don't have any, didn't have any option really. So I just sort of went over there, couldn't, no sign of any livestock. It was pretty dark pretty getting pretty dark it was about 10 o'clock at night in the summer so put pack my tent whatever have a have a sleep um and I wake up in the morning to this sound and I'm woken up by this sound of like <laughs> and it's like actually coming in stereo <laughs> and I was in my tent I was not in my tarp I was in my tent and I was what the hell is that and I looked out the out of the tent and it was like two cows licking the dew off my off my, off my tent and I thought oh well, that's quite sweet that's quite funny you know, they're not trampling me or whatever um and then like more when once I put my head out more cows sort of started <laughs> drifting forward like, that thing that green thing has woken up and it's stuck its head out what it, can it be let's go and have a look and then I noticed a lot a cow that was larger than all the other cows um sort of coming towards me through the cows and it's actually obviously turned out to be a bull um of and a really terrifying looking bull and it was like hissing at me kind of making this kind of hissing sound and I just thought oh gosh what is that um uh what am I going to do like is it going to actually just going to pour me you know to death with its <laughs> with its hooves and so I was like freaking out and I thought okay what I'm going to have to do is just close the tent and then just have to get everything packed up inside the tent and then sudden somehow rustle up the tent together really quickly and just chuck it all on the bike and just run for it um and at that moment i this is where it gets a bit x-rated so if you need well or just a bit disgusting at that moment you know when you have a moment of panic or something in that sort of situation you know you've got to do something well i really really needed to go to the loo and like i'm not i'm not just a wee okay we get the picture, like, I'm in the tent, i need the loo and like what am i going to do and I kind of look around sort of for a prop in the tent. And I, all I have is like this like carton from um, a small plastic carton of soup that I'd had from my supper <laughs> the previous night. Oh so, so like I basically think, okay, it's gonna, I'm gonna have to do it, I, no choice. <laughs> Cause I'm not gonna be able to do all this packing up while I'm in this condition. So I'm gonna have to evacuate and, um, whatever so I start ring the emergency gate button and um fill the carton of soup back up lovely. again lovely okay mm -hmm. uh, and it just about fits <laughs> get the lid on really firmly <laughs> and then <laughs> then feel a lot more relaxed obviously and I'm able to kind of do all the things that I plan to do yeah. and like pack it all in including the soup the former soup and um and now everybody's just turned off. They just like, well, I've come to listen to the joys of exploring Britain by bike, and I'm hearing about someone shitting into a pot. That's okay. Um, but that was. I think they were laughing. Um, <laughs> but did you get trampled by the bull in the end? Bad. I thought the conclusion was going to be, the and then I threw my poo at the bull, and that's <laughs> that saw to it. <laughs> I never threw a throw poo at a bull. <laughs> Where did you learn that? Okay, that was the right no, 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 of no, no. <laughs> um, okay, well, it's now 9 pm. Um, so I obviously we started late, so let's definitely continue. We've got a few more questions and some lovely uh, uh, comments coming in. But in case people do need to leave now because it's um, the kind of official end time, shall we quickly do a how do we buy your books, Jack? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got a prop. Here we go. 
Oh, we can't see work? it. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> there we go. Lostlanes.co.uk. <laughs> so yeah, I've got books here. Um, some books here and I'll happily sign them for you. And um, and obviously it makes a huge difference if you buy them from here than any other place because I get like multiples of the amount of money that I get from like a bookshop sale or a Amazon sale or whatever. Yeah, of so, course. And um, yeah, we should probably mention, authors. yeah, definitely buy direct. And if you must buy online, try to buy from a bookshop online. We, bookshop.org isn't as, it isn't that the place yeah bookshop.org we'll has the got hierarchy. all the links to the local places yeah 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 okay okay so if you are happy to stick around for 10 more minutes jack and then if our very happy audience will do so as well uh, we have one question about and, and again this is something that you and i talked about a little bit the other day um about the future of cycle touring so someone on the on the questions james mccorgan has said um we've been talking about the pandemic and climate change and what that means for cycling obviously things have very much changed now times are very different now so what how do you see things in the uk being in the coming years with regards to cycle commuting um touring and transport wow big question um i mean in terms of transport um it does seem to be like there's a kind of inexorable rise of like more and more cars, bigger cars uh, being driven with less patience and understanding um, than ever. And it's like against that, you know, we've got the sort of low traffic neighborhoods, cycle paths, cycle tracks on, on main roads and things like that. And it does feel like things in some places have got better. And I think that uh, places that have chosen to do that are beginning to show results. And you've got to hope that, that that kind of example means something to the other places. Um, there are some parts of the country that are just absolutely committed to like cars, cars, cars. Um, but I think, I think that that's just, that just doesn't lead anywhere ultimately at, to, as, a, as a proposition. They're just kind of like trying to hold back the inevitable. Um, but you know, in the meantime, I do worry my children are five and seven and they, when we had the lockdown, um, we were able to cycle around our town, like the first lockdown, whatever we were, what are we, what are we on lockdown five now or something. But the first one in like March of last year, April last year, we could just, they could cycle around the town um, to their friends' houses, you know, and wave through the windows and all this kind of stuff, um, which was really, really nice. Um, and then as soon as, you know, it went back to normal, I was like, you know, again, terrified of them cycling on the road with me and that, that's in a small market town you know in rural wales um that's not in you know a big city or a, or, or or even a, a, a big town um, or even a small city so um yeah and, and obviously the network you know it, it's got it's, it's only as strong as its weakest link so um you know it's going to take a long time before it's as easy as it is to get anywhere in the net as it is in the Netherlands or other sort of cycling friendly countries. Um, on the subject of touring and that kind of thing, I think that this whole gravel bike kind of explosion and adventure bike has just been brilliant um, because now kind of doing the kind of cycling that I do, although it always it does seem to be in, done in a little bit more of a rad kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, different way from me. Cycle touring is still uncool, isn't it, really? Um, but adventure <laughs> cycling, which is pretty much cycle touring, is very cool. Um, um, and um, yeah, I think that is great. And I think if people are being sort of marketed bikes to do, you know, to go off the beaten track, not just to like do Strava or to emulate the Tour de France riders, then that's great. And the bike industry does seem to be doing that and people do seem to be lapping it up. I do wonder whether sometimes it's actually roadies who are just sick of the inexorable rise of traffic on the roads and like think, you know, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to get a gravel bike and like stay on the towpath or whatever. And, and that is almost like a sign of, of, of losing, losing the battle, I suppose. But no, I, I think overall, that's not actually what it's all about. Um, there's a little bit of that. Um, but I think mostly it's about people just waking up to, you know, the possibilities that are out there with a, with a bicycle that's a bit more capable than, than like an out and out road race bike, which most mm. people don't need. 
Um, I think e-bikes are going to be huge, are huge already in terms of sales. Most local bike shops that you speak to are being kept in business by their e-bike sales. Um, interesting. Yep. And I think e-bike touring is really interesting. I was a few years ago coming back through um, Burgundy in France and did a day cycling, hired some bikes there. And like we were the, <laughs> they were just being passed by these like squadrons of of silver haired cyclists on their e-bikes going from like one vineyard to the next. Um, and it was just wonderful. Um, and, you know, the more that can be part of the mix, the better, um, cause they're brilliant e-bikes. Yeah. Um, I think, I think one thing I would like to say, and I don't know, this is probably going to win, maybe be a bit controversial in the present company, but I think, or at least some of the present company, but I think this whole sort of social media, particularly Instagram thing about like more and more extreme, more and more exotic holidays, which mm. is basically facilitated by completely unsustainable air travel and, and, you know, sh you know, a weekend trip to Mallorca so you can get some great stuff for your Instagram on your bike um, or, or, you know, flying out to somewhere to Switzerland for the weekend or whatever, or a long weekend, or to be honest, flying anywhere on a bike. <laughs> it's just like, if you care about the environment, then you really can't be, you know, you really can't be flying for like a holiday. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't want to preach, but that's the conclusion that I've reached personally. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm doing. And I hope that my contribution can be to persuade people that there's so much on our island that's worth doing. And then a short ferry ride away in France, you've got the whole of blinking France. And if you think Britain's yeah. good, wait till you find out about France <laughs> and Spain. So, you know, and yeah. Italy. Couldn't so, agree more there, know, I Jack. Think, I think Couldn't agree more. People just need to have a bit more time, maybe. That's the thing. Maybe people are a bit, you know, trying to crush too much exciting, wonderful stuff into their like short periods of holiday. And I can really understand that because I do a lot of my cycling, you know, from my work. So I'm not in a position to say, oh, you know, you should all just go off for like six weeks cycling around France and mm. not fly out to Mallorca. But I think it, I think I think the flying thing, flying with bikes is is probably it's probably got to stop. I don't know. OK, well, I think, um, yeah, I think we'll probably bring the, the evening to a close now. I think uh, that that kind of final sort of message of. Um, you know the simplicity of the bicycle and the and the uh, you know bringing it back to kind of basics and and using it as a method of exploration which is so simple and so satisfying and and we can have all the adventures that uh, that we that we really need sort of um, without really going far at all and your books will very much help us do that because um, yeah highly highly recommended um, so I hope that you all in the audience can thank um, can join me in thanking Jack. Um, we've already had lots of comments coming through, scrolling through now, saying um, thanks from people who've really enjoyed the talk. So thank you so much. This is just uh, such oh, a well, lovely. Thanks for having me, Anna, yeah. and asking such great questions. And thank you to everybody who's who's shown up on this. Yep. Uh, Tuesday and, evening and there were lots of um, lovely questions come through as well through the q a so um, yes thank you so much and thanks very much laura um, we need to give laura the kudos as well for yeah. organizing this whole thing so thanks so much laura are you going to pop back in for the last second maybe maybe not um but yes good night everybody safe cycling um there is oh there she is hi Hello. hi hi laura and tim thanks, hi guys. Super, super talk um, and yeah, I just wanted to say that there are still loads of events going on until Sunday. Sunday is when the festival clothes, closes. Yeah. So please take a look Sunday. at the website and um, look on to any more. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all. Good night. Bye bye. Happy cycling. Right. Cheers, Anna.